Okay, this is uh, VMworld 2012. This is SiliconAngle.com and SiliconAngle.tv's exclusive continuous coverage of VMworld 2012. This is day three. I'm John Furrier, the, the founder of SiliconAngle.com. I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante at Wikibon.org. We're here with Chris Hoff. Uh, you know him as At Beaker, uh, longtime Cube guest, Cube alum, you know, one of our favorites. Uh, welcome back. Thank you, sirs. Never a dull moment. Chris, so I got to ask you, um, you know, you're at Juniper now, you're obviously all over the security space. Last year at VMworld we asked you, what's the security story there? And it was kind of an obvious question at the time. They didn't have much going on. Um, so this year I got to ask the question, what's going on with security? A lot of announcements. What's the signal from the noise on the security? SDN, I mean that's, yeah, that's no, got to no, be no, scary. I, I, think we're, I think there's been a, a huge misunderstanding. Uh, people, it's actually SDM. Okay. Not N, M. So it's M. Software defined marketing. Ah, so there we go. So so that's that's now the it. truth comes out. Now they're Actually, going to, I'm so, so I'm going to find data center now. No, no, I'm looking for software defined software because <laughs> that's going to be the, that's the big next big thing. So interesting uh, <laughs> question because I think what, uh, what has obscured a lot of uh, the security messaging is uh, kind of rebuilding uh, or continued uh, effort towards um, making sure that as they've transitioned, uh, VMware's transition from an infrastructure virtualization centric play to cloud, right? Can't swing a dead cat without saying the cloud word. Um, we haven't seen a lot of um, uh, large changes take place in the security space with, with regard to the portfolio. I mean, there's things and improvements with uh, you know, uh, uh, V-Shield uh, endpoint, there's some polishing around access control, but for the most part, no big splashy moves. And I think this is in, is, uh, in advance of what we're seeing with, um, for example, the acquisition of Nasira, what that's going to do to the underpinnings of virtual networking, which in the, in, in, for the most part, whether you like it or not, whether you believe in virtual or physical and the interfacing of the two from a security perspective, the networking elements uh, are really how the security industry hinges their solution sets. Okay, so, uh, so they have good marketing. Yep. Um, that's great, but I mean, you got to buy the concept that, yeah, moving from the as a hypervisor to kind of an environment enabling infrastructure is a good move for VMware. Yeah, absolutely. It's just there's a lot of work to do. Can you tell us, in your expert opinion, the kinds of areas that are uh, that they need to hyper focus on right now? Yes, uh, from a security perspective, you mean? Just well, secure and in, in yeah. general, the top well, I mean, top three. So the transition, uh, meeting with customers, uh, large enterprises, is a great is a great bellwether for for how I look at some of the problem sets. And and what we're seeing right now is you know, a tremendous push and focus on, again, trying to deal with what new application architectures and the deployment scenarios associated with them and the programmatic languages and the shift in how people are using apps and, and what that means from a security infrastructure uh, perspective. So what I mean there is, if you look at the fact that security really should be protecting applications and information in the first place, we have to get as close to the application's information as we can. So you start to add in things like software-defined networking, where now, uh, the workloads, orchestration provisioning thereof are kind of, the control and data planes are separated, uh, meaning the way in which you do traffic steering and service insertion to get close to the application to protect it uh, makes for some interesting challenges. Um, because of the increased vulnerability. Well, well just, just kind of the, the notion that the landscape itself and where these applications can be parked can be in, in, incredibly diverse. We've had conversations a lot about how vMotion stresses uh, environments, and while people are starting to use vMotion and DRS and these sorts of things where mobility comes into play for the virtual machines, for the most part, you have clusters of machines, and a, there's not a lot of, a, a there's not a tremendous amount of movement with workloads within those in an enterprise, right? They pretty much, they don't scale and they don't massively distribute because most large enterprises are trying to actually consolidate their data center footprints down. So what that means is that in many cases, when we think about how enterprises, large ones, are trying to figure out how to reconcile from an operations perspective, how to protect applications, they're still kind of, well, I've got this massive operational understanding and set of processes and practices and people well attuned to doing zoning and segmentation in the physical network, and I got this other layer, albeit very, you know, very impressive from, a, from, from the pr perspective of applic uh, application abstraction, but it runs completely separate tools different processes, different orchestration and operations. So reconciling the two and integrating them is, is a huge challenge, which means if you really want to use the word open and you really want to embrace this notion of ecosystem, it's got to be more than you know, a bunch of AV vendors plugging into an endpoint API and a bunch of networking vendors kind of circling nervously around mm -hmm. the, the eclipsing um, uh, kind of definition of, of networking. And, and, and we, we, we need tighter, better, more broadly um, uh, defined access points.
Okay, so let me let me let me throw another one, at, another angle at you. One is one of frothiness. Obviously, software-defined marketing, software-defined networking has created a surge of entrepreneurial activity. Yep. Um, Arista went out there when it was kind of hard to raise money. They did a good job, awesome and they're job. doing very very well. Yep. Uh, Jay Shree was on, and she's smiling because valuations are up and everyone's happy. And, <laughs> and so now this financing coming in the center. So good news for networking. Yep. Okay, good job. Hot again. So so it's hot, and that's that's great because it's hard work. So I want you to share with the audience, one, how hard it is to actually do this stuff, um, kind of at a, at, a, at a high level, and two, uh, network virtualization. What that all really means. Yeah, so we've got, the, we've got the battle of approaches, right? You have the fabrics of the world, which are kind of, uh, if we start at the networking bottom, the networking uh, layer and move up, we've got this approach with fabrics, which in many cases, when you're thinking about how these new cloud scale applications are being written, fabrics, whether you're talking about a service provider or in an enterprise, will allow you to take advantage more flexibly of how you do application deployment without having to necessarily rely on physical, uh, on the physical infrastructure the same way you used to. It's important, but you've got to tie the physical and virtual together. We, we kind of juxtapose them as though they're separate and at odds with one another, mm -hmm. but if we've learned anything through history, we see re repetition of cycles that go between infrastructure and software and infrastructure and software. That w we shouldn't be surprised by the fact that we're seeing this again. But I think operationally, people are looking at, on, on, on the one hand, you get all the awesome benefits of flatness and low latency, high-speed interconnectivity for things like HPC or just you know, really low latency applications in data centers. And then what security guys are forced to do, less on security and more on compliance, as we discussed last panel, if you remember, yeah. is then you go and you chop this beautifully flat, high-performance, fabric-enabled network up into VLANs and IP subnets logically, and then you have to figure out how to interpose security on top of that as you add a layer of software that then runs the VMs, your, right? Your, so your pet peeve of an afterthought. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's still very much a bolt-on approach because we're very fragmented. Does, does, uh, does software-defined networking change that a bit? Is it a clean sheet of paper? Is it a do-over, as Dave always says? And, and you know, I mean, we had Simon Crosby on, he's got a whole startup, um, yep. Romeo, we can talk about that in a minute, but yeah. you know, obviously there's new approaches, so what's the, what's the strategy there? Or does it there? bring in new complexity? You talk about separating the control and the data planes, yep. does that bring in new complexity? So, so it can, right? I think the promise of what uh, virtualization as a whole, especially network virtualization at the layer in which it's defined today, as well as software-defined networking, um, gives you a, a layer of uh, and, uh, capability and opportunity to kind of figure out how can I do things like traffic steering and service insertion broadly inserted across uh, this landscape of networking no matter where my workload is. And by separating control and data plane, you can in practice and in theory get much better integration between disparate players in the ecosystem by standardizing on API, call, API calls, allowing you to basically define from the perspective of, of security the requirements and then making a call that says instantiate this policy. Now that policy can be interpreted by any number of players in the space, but what we don't have is, in, is an agreement in the industry, for example, you can take 10 different security vendors, and to do something we've been doing for 20 years, define a five-tuple ACL, right? Source, destination, service, and what I want to do with it, uh, you, you'll get 10 different answers, which is ridiculous. So what, what the promise of, of you know, software-defined networking, software-defined security, some people don't like those words, hi, Edward. Uh, the notion is, is that- We know where you stand uh, on yeah, that. I, we can programmatically uh, get closer to being able to kind of abstract this in meaningful and useful ways. But it still comes down to the controlling interest and setting of the agenda by the platform players themselves to allow you to interact with that space. So, you know. So that's a challenge to VMware directly. Well, it is, I mean, but at the same point in time, it's a challenge they just answered, right? What they just did with the acquisition of Nasir, brilliant. Right, just disrupted the networking, uh, the networking uh, industry for another two years as we, we sort out what we're going to do to be able to play by their rules in, in terms of being able to, whether you have your own SDN strategy or not. If you're in a large enterprise, regardless of whether you're going to deploy OpenStack or you're going to deploy you know, vCloud Director, which hypervisor you're going to deploy, they've basically okay, so the, hijacked. Okay, so I got it. So I got to ask you a question. That brings up images in my mind that, that, that look like a cold war. Are we in a cold war of networking? A cold war, you know, I like the way you said that. I think we're in a, you know, it's been a, I, when has it not been a cold war yeah. of networking? I mean, <laughs> are we in a defrost cycle or a chill cycle? I think the, the notion the here Cuban is- The Cuban Missile Crisis, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cuban Missile, that's a good way. You just take off, your, take off our shoes and bang and it on the desk, Khrushchev style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I think, uh, I think that's a, a very interesting question. I think, you know, ultimately, as, as ecosystem players, whether you think about compute, network, or storage, I think the dark horse in this that we haven't brought up yet is actually Intel. Right? I think besides the $7 billion acquisition of McAfee, I think it was $7 billion, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It's pretty large. The notion here is that if you look at the features and functions from a networking perspective, when you look at 
security capabilities uh, and like the Intel's DPDK, right, their development kit, where you can get massive amounts of throughput of virtualized network instantiation in the chipsets and the McAfee acquisition and the ability to ultimately then integrate there. Now you've got the foundational compute layer kind of going to war against the foundational abstracted compute layer in the hypervisor players and the, the stack players, and then inserting in the middle of this is the networking vendors, right? It's this three-way cold war of, uh, <laughs> of, of intrigue. <laughs> the Soviet Union broken up into multiple yeah, pieces. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so um, that's awesome. We can riff on that on the cube. We're like musicians up here playing different notes, but <laughs> I'm going to go back to developers. So let's get yeah. back to the entrepreneurial cycles, because yeah. obviously it's hard to do networking. You've know, you got to raise, a, you know, I think we talked about this, about you got to raise a boatload of money, to, to compete with Juniper and Cisco is just very difficult. It's hard to see a startup coming out into the systems game and, and doing that, it's really difficult. But then again, you see what Nasira did uh, with, on the software side. So the question is, um, and, and knowing it, that it's really hard to do. It's hard, it's hard science, it's really a lot of, a lot of geekiness. Uh, it's not as trivial as writing some, some Rails code. So, so the question is, Juniper had this Junos thing going on that was a really great, noble mission around yep. getting developers. So. Yep. Talk about the future and your vision of a developer ecosystem in this, e in this new environment. So if this is truly a new way, which I argue it is, and it's positive, it's just got to get sorted out. Is there a developer environment that looks like open source or looks like uh, a traditional developer environment? Yeah. So what I find interesting is, depending upon the types of applications you're defining, if you're talking about things like applications that can directly interact and control the network and vice versa, and they don't have to be bi-directional control, they can be telemetry that allows the network to inform the apps and vice versa, but you have to define who, who, who sets the agenda in terms of roles of who can actually in instantiate a request to change network topology or change quality service or change the way an application behaves. I think what, what you're seeing is abstracted environments like Amazon Web Services where you have folks like Netflix who basically use the, uh, a service provider's network, which is programmatically orchestrated and interfaced in a way that in, in some cases, is, from a security perspective, is completely abstracted from what they do above it. The notion that uh, you can have developers at Netflix writing network-aware applications that can allow the applications to make smarter decisions on where they deploy based on latency, performance, scale, definitely an ecosystem. How quickly, a large enterprise can adapt and evolve around just give me a pipe and an IP address to I want pools of resources to I want pools of resources that allow my application vendors to take into consideration things that like latency, like performance, like availability of scale. Um, is, it's a slower pace. So in the long term, when you look at things like Junos, your ability to write applications on a platform like Juno Space and directly control and interact with the network to do bandwidth calendaring, to do uh, implementation and, and uh, absorb protocols like OpenFlow without having to change your core routing and switching code, it's extremely valuable, but the definition of a developer and the definition of an application in that space is pretty critical to understand, right? You don't have somebody writing necessarily uh, a game developer um, writing things that, that controls the network. Uh, they, sh they, they don't necessarily they don't necessarily care about that unless yeah. they have requirements that require them or the search provider can kind of bubble those, those, those I, I think that I think that'll be a driving force to maybe keep the vendors on their toes. I mean, if we can somehow get that definition kind of defined in a way that's not awkward, you mentioned that awkwardness yeah. of jamming you know, security into this area. Yeah. But if, you, if we can get to that point, you know, that's Nirvana. I mean, that's, that would be, then that would leverage Jun Junos, Juniper, Cisco, Arista. I mean, Arista's got to be saying to themselves, hey, you know, I want to get these new startups working on my platform. Yeah, I mean, and, look, and vice versa if, with if, we can, if we can stop being fragmented as an industry, right, and, and be able to come together to uh, understand that as an architecture, software-defined networking benefits all of us, because it actually allows us to add way more value as vendors to the equation, and you know, you can differentiate your products based on what you subscribe to. The challenge is, it's, we can't have 15 versions of software-defined networking. Okay, so here's my final question, because we got to wrap up and get to our next guest is, um, Two questions, twofold. First, tell me, tell the folks out there in a, as, as lay language possible, what this software-defined networking this year acquisition really means to VMware and to the world, um, and give your perspective on that. And two, what's your, what's your outlook for the next year, year and a half, in terms of the market around networking? Yeah, so, I, right, I'm a security guy, right? So I'll, I'll give you the security version of that. <laughs> so I think what, what you get with, uh, with Nasir and software-defined networking is, is basically a rewrite of the way in which security operators and the ecosystem interact with the very perch that we've enjoyed for a very long time. Um, whether you consider native API accesses to hypervisors, 
uh, the, the way forward or not, or whether it's a, you know, the, a, a combination of virtual and physical networking, uh, I think the, what, what the Nasir acquisition, what SDN does in general, is allow us to take the vision of deploying service layers, security, networking, applications, in, just in, in, a, in, a, in clearly a way more fluid, automated uh, uh, fashion. So I think it was a brilliant move on, on VMware's part. It also gives them access to uh, things like OpenStack, which is a whole other interesting That's angle, a right? Panel, right? That's Cir an hour right there. Yeah, circling the wagons <laughs> or a sniper <laughs> rifle, depends <laughs> on how you look Saved at it. Um, but I think, it, I think it's fantastic because actually, folks like VMware, to their credit, because I don't want this to come off negative, right, really do get to control and set the agenda and keep networking vendors honest about how we serve our customers and interact with them. Sometimes it makes for you know, that Cold War scenario. Sometimes it also gives us different ways to think about approaching solutions that otherwise we would uh, be more constrained with. So looking forward, you know, uh, to, ask, to answer your second uh, question, I think what's, what's really, really fundamentally interesting is to see now uh, how networking and security vendors will navigate this, this um, environment to figure out how they can play and offer the same sorts of capabilities. But to do that, we really need uh, a consistent way that we can plan our roadmaps on in, 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 of interfacing and connecting our, uh, our uh, solutions to this virtualization layer, not, not, not distracting or abstracting it more and more apart because large enterprises and service providers build their networks first and then they put applications on top of them. And the challenge is if the two don't meet in the middle and it's ugly, all of the benefits that we get out of software to find anything fall through the cracks because you end up in this finger point again. And yeah, VMware, you, in your view, yeah, they've earned that right to provide that consistent I view. Think, I think and so. They've well, made they, a move to... Yeah, and, and, but they also, <laughs> the, I mean, they, they've earned that right, but, but, they, but, but so have the networking vendors to be able to participate in that, in that discussion. Cisco, Juniper, Brocade, all well, of them. Well, you can't do without them. Right? Uh, well, yeah. th maybe they think they can, but I, I, I think that's a tough road to hoe. Uh, yeah, all right, well, agree. just, we're going to wrap up, but I got to just get one quick comment because I just thought of it and I wrote it in my notes down because Todd Nielsen used the word application server hell. And that one of the things vFabric does is gets people out of that hell. So at the application level, is that hell? These older applications, is it hell? Application well, servers? Yeah, so I, say, I think the, the thing is when people look at cloud, you have two schools of thought. You have a, a camp that says, how can I move my old apps to cloud, which is kind of a, I think that's a road that just never ends. And yeah. I'm not sure that that's the right way to approach things. Mm -hmm. And that's, you will get into application that's server That's an easy hell. road to take, but not necessarily the right road. No, so yeah. the other one, which is more difficult, but, but more prudent to take advantage of all of these new capabilities is actually to rewrite applications or think about different ways of serving them. You talk to to uh, James Waters from uh, v uh, VMware a little while ago, and I think ultimately what the move up the stack from infrastructure focus to platform focus with platform as a service or just platforms in general get us closer to merging what we do with the application layer, what we do with the network layer, consolidating, providing you know, consistent interfaces that actually makes security a much more interesting story. At infrastructure layer, it's a pain in the ass. It will be for decades, just given the way it's structured. Pass is a, is a huge disruption, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, Enterprises are adopting it uh, internally as well as externally. I think it's a, it's, it's a great opportunity to do things better. Okay, Chris Hoff, always a great guest. Um, love the insight, uh, high clock speed like Pat Gelsinger, <laughs> rattling off physical, virtual, all this stuff, and uh, it's just tough to keep up. I like, I his, mean, I like his high, high paycheck to go along with my high yeah. clock speed. <laughs> awesome. We'll be right back with our next guest here inside theCUBE, siliconangle.com's theCUBE. We'll be right back. That's great. <laughs>